welcome to Shurat Hadin's Towards a New Law of War conference. Please turn off your telephones. I'd like to introduce our fearless leader, Nitsana Darshan Leitner, to open the conference. Shalom, good morning, and welcome to Jerusalem. My name is Nisana Dorshan Leitner. I'm the founder of Shurat Hadin, Israel Law Center, the one who sponsors this conference. Shurat Hadin is a civil rights organization based in Israel that utilizes the court systems around the world to go on the offense against Israel's enemies. We fight the terror organizations and their financial patrons, the rogue regimes that sponsors them and support them and provide them with material aid, and the banks that provide them with financial services. Our goal is to go after the terrorist organizations funding in order to bring their activity to a halt and to get a measure of compensations for the terror victims from those who devastated their life. Throughout the spring of 2014, the Hamas terrorist organizations in Gaza had fired hundreds of rockets into civilian targets in Israel. The Palestinian goals was very clear, to kill as many Israeli civilians as possible. On June 12, 2014, Hamas terrorists kidnapped three teenagers, seeking to hold them hostage to release Hamas prisoners from Israeli jails. Instead of ransoming them, though, they murdered the three boys and left their bodies in a field. At the same time, the Islamic extremists were also busy preparing their terror tunnels with a intent of launching a massive operation from Gaza against Israel. They intended to infiltrate Israeli populated communities near the border, kidnap civilians, and murder them. Hamas saw the provocation against Israel. They dared the IDF to respond. Their deadly rockets from Gaza continued and continued, and finally, Unable to hold back any longer, the IDF commenced Operation Protective Shield in July 8th to neutralize the terrorist rocket from Gaza. For over seven weeks, we Israelis were forced to run several times a day into the bomb shelters. In the southern communities, families moved directly into the shelters to be close by, too afraid they would not be able to reach the shelters in time. Every area of the country, south to north, east to west, was targeted. No one could be certain that they were safe. We lived as a country at the mercy of the Palestinian terror organizations. Life was interrupted, and there was no longer any daily routine. Reservists were called up to their units, their families and neighbors nervously prayed for their safety. Parents pulled their children out of the summer camps. Workers stayed home. Flights to Ben Gurion Airport were canceled. More than 4,500 rockets were launched by the terrorists. The Iron Dome, which successfully shut down most of the rockets, became the only topic of conversation of everyone's lips for the 50 days of the war. Hamas openly hide behind human shields throughout the 50 days conflict. The terrorists did not wear signia, they wore plain clothes. They operated in the densely populated towns and forced civilians to remain close by as they assembled the rockets launchers. Repeatedly, they used women and children to provide them cover and deter the IDF from firing at them as they aimed their weapons at Israeli cities. 
The Gaza terrorists did not fire from army bases nor from secluded areas. Instead, they cowardly utilized United Nations schools and facilities mosque and residential apartment buildings as launching pads for the rockets. This included Wafa Hospital in Gaza City, which the terrorists used as their command center and rockets launching site, knowing Israel would be afraid to bomb it. According to the IDF, Hamas repeatedly opened fire from the hospital windows and fired anti-tech missiles from its roof. Hamas and the PLO strategy was clear, to fire at Israeli cities from their own civilian buildings and residential centers in the hope of provoking an Israeli military response, which would result in the death of Arab civilians and the destruction of buildings. In this manner, they could terrorize and disrupt life in Israel while ensuring that the IDF and the Israeli government would garner international condemnation each time it sought to neutralize the missile threat to Israeli civilians. The IDF was forced to send warnings each time before it could to return fire to ensure that civilians had an opportunity to flee. And this frequently provided the terrorists the chance to escape as well. Indeed, each time Israel targeted the missile launchers and casualties resulted, we in Israel watched the same cynical scenario play out as it if in a dark comedy. Hamas would announce that all the dead were civilians and that Israel had intentionally targeted innocent Palestinians. International, immediately the European Union, the United Nations, the human rights groups, even the US State Department would condemn the IDF and call for investigation. The international media went on and on for weeks complaining about Israel's disproportionate use of force. The drumbeat calling for a war crime investigation of Israeli soldiers and IDF officers began on the very first day of the Gaza war. And it continued ringing throughout the 50 days of fighting as Hamas and the PLO continued the terrorist attacks. The allegations of war crimes has not stopped until today. This past week, the United Nations released a report finding that the IDF deliberately targeted UN schools while underplaying that the UN facilities were used by the terrorists for weapons drums, training centers, and launching sites. Barely a day goes by now without the Palestinian leadership threatening to take Israel to the International Criminal Court. They have signed the Rome Treaty, and submitted their membership to the court to execute this goal. In late June, the United Nations Human Rights Commission will release its report. It's already being called Goldstone II, and it will find Israel guilty of war crimes. It will recommend that the matter will be referred by the Security Council to the ICC. We Israelis are no longer shocked by the cynicism, by the bias, by the anti-Semitism of the Europeans, of the Scandinavians, and of the United Nations. We understand the world does not value very much the safety and security of Israeli citizens facing terrorist attacks. Instead, they spend their time, resources, and diplomatic energy raving about the fictional crimes being perpetrated against the Palestinian civilians' populations, further facilitating the Palestinians' endless narrative of victimhood. But by the same token, we do not agree, nor can we agree to ignore this blood libel. We need to respond, to speak out, and we need to act. The current state of affairs cannot continue. The current laws of warfare are anachronism. They are outdated. They were enacted at a time after World War II when war was not as complicated, when non-state actors did not pose this sort of threat to the civilian populations of democratic states as they do today. The Geneva Convention never envisioned the, uh, the mass rocket crews of Hamas, the PLO, Islamic Jihad, terror organizations. This conference is a response to the inadequacies of the international laws to address the
this new asymmetrical warfare as it plays out in war zones such as Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Syria, and Yemen, as well as Gaza and South Lebanon. Towards a new law of war was conceived as a conference devoted to redefining the law of war as it applies to the modern battlefield. We hope to begin an international discussion on the need to change the laws of warfare so that democratic states and their armies can adequately fight back and survive. So they can protect their own civilian populations and defeat the aggressors who target civilians while using their citizens as human shields. Simply stated, terrorist organizations intentionally target civilians and when democratic countries fight back, they are falsely accused of war crimes. If the international law is going to be applied to this asymmetrical warfare, that it must reflect the current realities of the methods and strategies used by the non-state actors, the terror organizations. Western soldiers who are under fire cannot return fire without reasonable certainty that they have identified where the hostile fire came from. They have specific protocols about when, where, how, and under what circumstances they can fire. In some circumstances, an IDF soldier must warn a potential attacker in three languages before he can use his weapon. A small deviation from those rules can send a soldier to a military trial, even to prison. This imbalance of moral approach must change. The Western militaries cannot be accepted to fight an unfettered, uncivilized enemy when at any given moment any single tactic they employed might be the subject of war crimes charges. The soldiers serving in democratic armies must know what is legal, what is not, what is fair, what is not on the modern battlefield. If the enemy determines not to follow these rules, that it's his choice, but it cannot then go, pleading to the International Criminal Court that it is a victim of war crimes when it is in fact the perpetrator. <laughs> Western military officials must be able to travel with all the rights and privilege granted to other governments and diplomatic officials without concern that they will end up on Interpol's most wasn't list or on trial in The Hague. Democratic societies can only remain free when they possess the political and military tools firmly in hand to fight for their freedom. Over the next two days, you will hear some of the world's foremost experts bringing deep and practical experience from academia, government, law, and the military. They will parse the issues and clear away the clouds behind which non-state actors can plan, execute, and thrive. We hope to establish this conference as an annual event until it will no longer be necessary. <laughs> Together, we will initiate a discussion to develop practical and immediate usable strategies to enable our honorable military forces to execute their missions without fear that their enemies will be able to turn their efforts back on them with allegations of war crimes. Our soldiers risk their life to protect and defend us. We are now privileged, indeed obligated, to try to protect them as well. Thank you.